I know we're not at a wrestling match, but you know, I'm excited. <laughs> um, hello everyone, welcome to the Alice McKay Room at the Vancouver Public Library. My name's Jorge Amigo and I'm the head of cultural programming here. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we're hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And I'm an immigrant from Mexico, which means I'm a settler in these lands, so I feel a particular responsibility to continue to learn about the ongoing effects of colonialism in this part of the world, and to do my part um, as a public servant in taking sincere actions towards decolonization. Now, speaking of actions, um, have you ever read the Yellowhead Institute's report on Canada's progress and reconciliation? Does anyone know what the Yellowhead Institute is? Awesome, great. So as you may remember, in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released 94 calls to action and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau personally promised to fully implement them. How do you think we're doing with that? <laughs> okay, chuckles is the right answer. Um, so after eight years, only 13 of the 94 calls to action have been completed since 2015, and absolutely zero calls to action were completed in 2023 last year. So this is a completion rate of less than two calls to action per year, which means that if Canada continues at this pace, it will take another 58 years until the calls to action are completed, meaning that indigenous peoples will have to wait until 2081 for reconciliation. So I'm sharing that because I think that um, a land acknowledgement is only meaningful if it leads to some action, and the action I'm hoping here is that you'll go home and Google the Yellowhead Institute, and right on their homepage, you'll see this report. It's only 13 pages, it's an executive report. Read it, it has some incredible piece of information, and it'll help us all understand why we're failing, how we're failing, and how this failure is affecting our society. And housing happens to be a key component of reconciliation, as Michelle has very eloquently written in McLean's recently. So let's get into this. So a quick show of hands, who here has been to the library before? Most of you, awesome. Uh, who's been to an event in this space in the last six months? Almost all of you, great. So a few housekeeping notes for those of you who haven't been here recently. Um, the bathrooms are located right outside this uh, space to the right. Uh, one favor please use that door in the back to get out of the space because this one's kind of like next to the stage, so it makes a lot of noise. Um, you're always welcome to come in and out as many times as you want. We're not at the ballet or the symphony, uh, so just remember to use that door in the back. Uh, take a moment right now to silence your cell phones. Um, you're welcome to take them out during the event, take pictures, videos, post on social media. Just remember to tag the Vancouver Public Library. We love that, but make sure you're not making noise with your phones. And the third housekeeping note is that our Friends from Upstart and Crow, the wonderful bookstore in Granville Island, are here selling books. They're over there. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> they do wonderful work to, uh, to advance the literary scene in this city. And um, so they're going to be selling books. Buy one copy or three. And uh, there's going to be a book signing afterwards over there. So today we're here to hear an amazing conversation uh, about a very, very uplifting topic that we all love to talk about, our housing crises or as Gregor Craig would call it, our crumbling foundation. Now, I have to confess that I, when I saw this book come out, I was very skeptical because I thought, yeah, 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 another journalist is gonna share some unrealistic proposals on how we're gonna solve this intractable issue and it's probably gonna be very dry and policy wonky, but I was wrong. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised because I'm a slow reader and I devoured this in two days. Even as someone who has stopped paying attention to housing because I've accepted the fact that I'm gonna have to leave Vancouver when my landlord renovates me. Um, but this book gave me hope because it is full of amazing ideas and examples from around the world. And I just really hope that our smart politicians read it. Well, actually all the politicians read it, not just the smart ones. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. So let me introduce them so they can tell you more about it. So Gregor Craigie has been a journalist for more than 25 years at the BB at BBC World Service, the CBC Radio, CBS Radio and Public Radio International. He has hosted On the Island on CBC Radio 1 in Victoria, BC since 2007. And his first book, On Borrowed Time, was a finalist for both the Balsillie Prize for Public Policy and the City of Victoria's Book Prize. And it was a Globe and Mail's top book, top 100 book in 2021. And his first novel, Radio Jetlag, was published in 2023. So let's give him a round of applause first. <laughs> <coughs> Michelle Sisa is the editor of indigenous-led conservation coverage for the Narwhal, as well as a contributing writer to The Walrus and a contributing editor to McLean's. Her story, The End of Home Ownership, was the most read 
cost of living story for McLean's in 2023. Michelle is a member of the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 6. Now, they're going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes, and then they're going to take questions from the audience. Very important. We are not auditioning speakers for next season. <laughs> so make sure you ask a question. Don't lecture us. Um, we also did some research, and we, find that we found out through extensive research that there is no such thing as a two-part question. <laughs> if you think you have a two-part question, you actually have two questions. <laughs> so pick one. Okay, Michelle Gregor. How's everybody doing? Feeling good about housing? <laughs> you're gonna feel better about housing in 45 minutes. Or worse, that's what you'll find out or now. Or worse. Yeah. All right, Gregor, hello. Hi, Michelle. Let's start by talking about when you decided to write this book. What was the moment that you thought, I have to write a book on how we solve Canada's housing crisis? Yeah. Uh, it's not that long ago, but I have to say, when I first moved to Vancouver in 1996 as a student, I thought within about a week, man, I should write a news story about housing. This is crazy, because I came from Alberta, and everybody in my cohort was talking about it. And then uh, fast forward many years, uh, my, my wife and I bought our first house in East Van, uh, near the East 29th Skytrain Station, and we thought we had committed uh, financial suicide because we spent $305,000 <laughs> on a single detached house, the cheapest detached house in the city of Vancouver. And uh, lo and behold, it was the best financial decision we ever made, of course. And it was just dumb luck, that nothing other than dumb luck, which I suspect a few other people in this audience have committed in their lifetime, just, just taking a wild guess. Uh, but, you know, it, it, the, the prices just kept going up and up and up. And I had, my wife had a child, and we had a second one, and we had a third one, and prices just for the most part kept going up. I mean, I know there were little dips, but really it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And on paper, my wife and I kept getting richer. It's the only financial thing I've ever done in my life that actually worked. And I mean the only financial thing that has ever worked for me and my wife. But then the, the, the epiphany came, I think it was January, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, homeowners, when I got my BC assessment in the mail, January of 2022, and it might be the last time I've had it in paper, and I ripped it open, and uh, I saw the assessment on the, the ramshackle 1912 house uh, I owned with my wife, and it said $1.3 million. Now, I know for a lot of homeowners in Vancouver, you're like, 1.3, give me a break. The studio apartment Jump here. change, yeah, exactly. Well, this was the first time we had surpassed one million, and briefly, I heard the bare naked ladies in my head, you know, if I had a million dollars, and, and I don't feel rich, e even though I know I am on paper, but I, uh, after about 10 seconds, I thought, uh, and excuse the, uh, the expression, my kids are screwed. And it's something I'd been worried about already. And then, you know, we were talking about this in the office, and I'm talking to 28-year-old equivalents of me, 27-year-old equivalents of me at CBC Radio where I work, and they're going, well, yeah, must be nice, buddy. Like, we, you know, uh, a colleague of mine who'd been uh, renovicted twice, evicted three times in 14 months, and we compared what his rent was for his not very nice two-bedroom in a not very nice part of town, and it was less, or sorry, more than I was paying on my mortgage, and he was just waiting to get evicted again. And like Jorge jokes, just wondering, how long can I stay here? So that's a long answer, but the, the, the epiphany for me was, we're screwed, this, this can't continue. How did it all go so wrong? And I thought, uh, I think I need to write a book to make sense of this. Who among us has not thought, I have to write a book <laughs> in two years to make this, I mean, I'm sure you wrote it faster than that, but that's a very short timeline to write a book. We can mm -hmm. talk about that. Uh, and I love how many numbers we're getting early in this conversation about your house values. It's a great yes, tone to set here. I know. Yes, incredible. Um, so housing is a topic we love to talk about in Vancouver especially, but everywhere in Canada. Um, and I imagine going into writing a book about housing is something where there are many ways to approach the subject. There's a lot of policy angles, there's a lot of social angles. How did you decide on your structure for this book, which for those of you who haven't read it yet, uh, examines you know the the expressions of the housing crisis in many cities in Canada in kind of comparison to other cities elsewhere in the world 
that have taken different approaches to addressing housing issues. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of case study approach to the housing crisis and the myriad responses available to it, um, most of which Canada has taken yet. So I'm curious how you arrived at that. What was your sort of approach for thinking through this book, for doing the reporting, for, for coming at this topic? Well, I, I knew from uh, uh, starting to write and describing the situations in Victoria, Vancouver, and Duncan, I knew I wanted to go across the country because it is a national problem, even if, of course, Vancouver is kind of ground zero. Uh, and as I was going across the country, I kept talking to people who had a friend or a brother or what have you who lived in Tokyo or London, where I used to live myself, or Paris or Singapore, what have you. And then, you know, I'd get these little asides as I was writing, and eventually I thought, you know, I'm going to put a chapter about that. And uh, I structured it in such a way that I, 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 I wrote it, and I had about half of it about Canadian problems, and then half of it on situations elsewhere. And uh, so the short answer to your question is, what did I do? How did I structure it that way? I found a good editor. So uh, Random House, the editor, Deirdre Molina, who's not here, but just in case she's watching this, w is a genius. She said, you know, this is great, uh, but you've, you've kind of got, and I'm paraphrasing here, about half of the book or 60% is kind of a litany of woe about how bad the situation is in Canada. And there's a chance that some people might read it and give up hope before they get to the part that's supposed to inspire hope, which is in many cases from other cities around the world. So instead of having bad, 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 here's some ideas that might inspire hope, uh, we decided to bring forward those ideas and just braid back and forth and go from Vancouver to Tokyo, uh, you know, the greater Toronto area to Paris and, and so on. It's really great. It, uh, it's kind of like when you're in pain and you stub your toe and that <laughs> takes your mind off the pain <laughs> of your current situation where every chapter is like a little relief from the Canadian context. Uh, and I wonder, you know, there were so many really interesting moments for me in this book. I think often when you're thinking about housing in Canada, you're thinking about it in this Canadian context and you're sort of limited by our, our national approach to this issue and history. And when you're reading about, you know, situations and the way it's been approached, say, in, in Mexico or in Japan, um, it's wild to see the contrast in, in people's opportunities or housing situations there. So, for instance, I was very struck by the chapter in Tokyo where renting is a low-stress situation for people because there's so much rental stock that they're like, if I don't like this place, I can just move to another place. Mm -hmm. I have all of these options, which if you're a renter in Vancouver is insane because you never if you have a rental that works for you you're never going to leave until they run evict you out of it and so it was fascinating and i wonder what was the biggest surprise for you when you were reporting on these other cities or contexts that that really made you think about housing in canada differently there were a lot of surprises and i appreciate you mentioning tokyo because i almost didn't include it and the reason why is i thought well a i interviewed a lot of uh, people in tokyo uh, and other parts of Japan, but primarily Tokyo, all of them had a tie to Canada. And every single one of them, like every single one of them said to me, I really want to come back to Canada, but it's too expensive. And I thought, how is this the city that I grew up thinking, well, in fact, it was the most expensive city in the world, and now these people are all living very comfortably there, very comfortably, and they can't afford to come back to Canada. Uh, but when I talked to them, a lot of them also said, but you can't compare Canada to Japan. It's apples to oranges, or as somebody said, it's apples to concrete. You, you know, what's the point? They're so different. The housing style is different. Finance is different. Uh, but here's the key thing. Japan has been losing population. And that's just such a huge difference that in so you, have to, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, and as a result, I think there are 8 million empty homes in Japan. Uh, I talked to uh, a Japanese-Canadian woman. She calls herself a digital nomad. She's desperate to come back. She owns uh, a condo, an apartment in Tokyo, but she also uh, inherited a ski lodge near Sapporo, and she was telling me about, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, worth, I don't know, uh, I think, she, oh, you know, like she got it for $10. Yeah. yeah, and, and, and uh, I know I, I keep saying this to people, but I just cannot get over the site. If you're on Instagram, or even if you're not, just look at Cheap Houses Japan, the account. It's insane. I mean, it's like going back to 1997 small town BC or something like that. The prices, you just think, what is this? This must be a joke. This must be a, it's so much cheaper. But, but all that to say, I almost didn't do it because I thought, well, what's the point? Like Japan doesn't really show us anything other than if you start losing population. And we led the G7 and OECD in population growth because of immigration the last couple of years. So what's the point? But you know what? Tokyo has actually been growing, was growing for decades. But they took a very different approach to housing construction 
uh, basically deregulating, taking away the, the power of local communities to say no, largely, which is a very controversial topic, I know. But they made changes, and it's led to a lot more, a lot quicker, and a lot more affordable housing. And that was one of the many things that really surprised me. But honestly, I was surprised place after place. Singapore, I, I know a lot of people here uh, in Vancouver have loose ties to Singapore, and there are many things about Singapore we do not want to copy, but boy, it's worth looking around the world from city to city, city to city. How is a city that's based largely on the free market economy around the world, how have they managed to have 90% home ownership, which actually means you own a condo, you don't own the land, you, you have a lease for 99 years, how have they managed to have 99, or, or pardon me, 90% home ownership, and almost all of it is, is public housing. What's going on there? That's worth looking at. They've got public housing uh, coming out of their ears. And it's not that, that Singapore is dirt cheap, because it's not. The, the most recent surveys put it uh, middle of the pack to, to above average in terms of affordability, but they have a very high home ownership rate, and that's something we should look at. There's so many measures they have there, inclu inf including compulsory savings. They have something called the CPF, the, the Central Provident Fund, which instead of just making uh, Singapore residents uh, save for retirement, they, they can actually use it for a down payment on a, on a home. Uh, having said that, huge caveats. You know, it's all great if you're a heterosexual married couple with kids, but boy, if you're not heterosexual, if you're not married, you're all of a sudden out of luck on most of these incentives. So, I, again, uh, so many countries, you cannot replicate any of them one-to-one, -one, but it's really worth looking at what different ideas are working elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, that's an interesting segue into my next question about how, you know, in this, in this book about housing, you're actually talking about all of these other social issues that are connected to housing, whether it's in Canada or abroad. So, you know, we often talk about the housing crisis as the inability of people who are, you know, middle class, um, who one or two generations ago would have been able to afford a single family home, who are now you know, finding themselves priced out of the city, priced out of home ownership altogether. And that's one expression of the housing crisis. But actually, as you get into in the book, you know, there's other more, more serious issues around housing. So there's the increasing crisis of homelessness, particularly in cities that are seeing this um, rapid increase in unaffordability and more extreme iterations of unaffordability, like Vancouver and you're seeing it in mental health crises that accompany this, um, you know, in situations like w women who are staying in abusive relationships because their housing is tied to their partner. And so there's, there's many social issues that are connected to housing. And I wonder what you think, you know, after spending so much time on this book, dwelling in these different expressions of how the housing crisis impacts our economy, our, you know, our career choices, childcare, education, every kind of facet of our lives, how do we make sense of those together? You know, how do we think of housing not just as an issue of shelter, but as a social issue? Yeah, that was that was one of the most uh, overwhelming things that just stood out to me after interviewing uh, a lot of uh, social housing providers in cities across Canada, including, I'll give you an example, uh, Carolina Ibarra in Victoria, where I live, Pacifica Housing. She talked to me about that, and she said she found it heartbreaking and also fascinating that over the last few years, since somewhere in the middle of the pandemic, uh, they had, they, sh she said, and she said this is anecdotal, but it feels like we've crossed a tipping point where uh, the majority of, of homeless people in the community were homeless, say five years ago, because of a mental health issue or addiction. But she said more and more, and now the majority, are, are simply becoming homeless because of economic issues. They're evicted and they cannot find anywhere else. They're living in their cars, they're sleeping on the streets. But what happens then, is that they, uh, they, they battle with addiction that they had under control beforehand when they had a, a roof over their head, or, or they find they're susceptible to whatever mental health issue it was before. So it's, it's flipping around, and we are actually seeing that this preconceived notion that a lot of people, including myself, have had for a lot of years, that you won't be homeless in Canada if, if you're not, if you have whatever uh, substance use and uh, mental health issues uh, under control. And I, I'm speaking really broadly here, but you know what I mean? That, that's, that was the cause of homelessness, a, th a lot of us thought. But I've talked to housing providers, uh, uh, social workers across the country who said, y you know what, more and more this is simply an economic issue, and then that is sparking or triggering the issues that we've all associated as being the cause of it to begin with. So, and you talked about precarity. Holy cow, the number of, like I, I talked to a single mother in Quebec 
and she is so with it. She is a publishing uh, 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 editor, manager, like details oriented, does not let anything slip her by. She's got four young kids, uh, relationship broke down, she was evicted, I'll, I'll spare you the long story, but she thought she'd be able to find a rental. She had a spotless record, decades of renting, but of course, you know, short-term rentals, people moving out of the cities during COVID, all of a sudden there's nowhere else for her to rent. She talked to me about the stress of it, just snapping at your children, the, the underlying things that people don't see. I mean, I called this book Our, our Crumbling Foundation because our, found, our, our house, or, or a home, is the foundation of your life. It's the underlying stability in your life. It doesn't replace your identity, or your family, but what else other than a home is the bedrock you need, a secure home, to get the rest of your life in order and maybe, who knows, exceed and, and you know, achieve your goals in life? Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, we're at a moment where homeownership rates in Canada kind of peaked around 69% of Canadians own their homes. It's down to, I think, around 61%. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, decline. It's much lower in younger generations, obviously. and and I think for a long time, this sort of mythology in Canada, that the national promise was if you work hard, you will be able to secure housing, right? That there was a, a sort of meritorious angle to it where um, making the right decisions would lead to stability, you know, whether that's ownership or a secure rental, if such a thing exists anymore in the city. And, and now we're really seeing, I think, the expressions of that breaking down where people have made all the right choices, they have done all the right things, they have good jobs, they have good incomes, they have you know, they have spotless records and they still can't find a place to live. And I wonder if you think we're in a moment of kind of national reckoning around that where um, we're really seeing that, you know, Canada is a country that prides itself on being a nation of fairness and equity and equality and, and those things, you know, in the housing market no longer apply. So much of it is about luck, inheritance, family wealth, family connections, and being, you know, buying a house at the right time, or in my situation, being born to people who bought a house at the right time. Um, and and kind of what the, the erosion of that national myth is doing to us as a, as a country with a national identity that I think is really under threat from this crisis. I, I think it is you're, you're, you hit the nail on the head, and you cited in your McLean's piece a poll about the number of people, I think under 40, who were either furious or angry about this. And it yeah. It was a heck of a lot of people. I can't remember. Yeah, the I think it's something like two thirds of people are. It's not just that they're they feel. You know, there's two sides to this. One is the despair that people experience, where so many people, especially younger people, just think that they're never going to be able to buy a home, and what that does for your entire sense of self, for your future planning. You know, if you think that you can never have security in the place where you live, if you can never really put down roots, if you're not sure when you can afford to have children or if it's a good idea to have children, mm -hmm. you know, if having a child will mean you have to leave your rental and possibly leave your job and possibly leave your home, like it, it destabilizes everything. So there's a kind of nihilism, I think, among a lot of people yeah. that's well-founded where they just think they have no security um, in the society that, they've, that they're contributing to. And the other side of it is anger, where people see the unfairness that's baked into housing mm -hmm. and they're very angry and I think they see a lot of contradictions in the housing policy that continues to um, really try to both appeal to owners who are understandably invested in their literal investment the value of their home um, and and you can't necessarily continue to see that grow the way we've seen it grow in Canada particularly in the last 15 years while increasing affordability yeah. so someone is getting the short end of the stick and a lot of those people really see it and are being quite polarized by it. Y you know, if, if you imagine, like I, I bought, my wife and I bought our house in East Van 20 years ago, and as I said, we paid 305,000. And I imagine if it goes at that rate for another 20 years, like what is that going to do to the whole generation that's just being locked out? And I wonder if I can just read a quote. This is one of the ones that really sticks for me from uh, Kel Selim, who is the chair of the Squam or the chairperson of the Squamish Nation Council. We, I was interviewing about a, 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 a Kel Selim about a number of things, including the Sanok development. And this quote really stands out for me. I, I can't deal with progressive lenses, so just uh, hopefully I won't fall off the stage here. Uh, where are we? Uh, okay, so. Uh, both rents and housing prices have become unfair, Kelsey Lund believes. No matter what income level your household has, very few households in urban areas now are getting a fair deal. And that's impacted a whole generation in terms of the future of who we are as a country. The ability to have a life, 
have a home, grow your wealth, especially if you come from an impoverished background. We're creating a whole economic class where one side has property and the other is just locked out. And, and to me, that kind of says it all. It's like we're literally, and it's not, I know this is not just young people. I mean, I, I bike to work 15 minutes every day in Victoria at 4.30 in the morning, and I, I can now count three old cars, beaters, that have seniors living in them, and I see them, and I, I don't know what to do. I talked to one of them, and she, and she ran away from me. These people, there's more and more people living in their cars uh, who are older. I get emails every day at work from people who, who are university educated. They, they're, they're collecting CPP, and they're worried about demo eviction mm -hmm. uh, you know, by real estate investment trusts, not just a basement suite. And, and I know it goes across generations, but I really think in addition to everybody of every age who's suffering, we're locking out a whole generation. And one last thing, it's across the country. Uh, uh, too many times I hear, including from my relatives in Alberta a couple of years ago, you know what, uh, go ahead, uh, people in Vancouver and Toronto will care, but this isn't a national prog uh, pr uh, problem. Oh yeah? The couple that I profile from the start, uh, at the start of the book, who give up on Vancouver, they, they grew up there, and they moved to Calgary, because they, they could finally uh, afford to buy a place, they just emailed me three days ago and said, you know what, uh, we're, we're cashing in, that's my term, not there, but we're selling our townhouse and we're buying a big house in Edmonton now for about the same amount of money. And they said, and, and uh, Martin, the fellow said to me, I, I do worry a, a bit though, it feels like it's spreading from city to city to city. And you and I were talking about, so does that mean Saskatoon's next after Edmonton? Yeah, don't go to Saskatoon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, it's a beautiful city. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, there's, so, so many things in there. One is, you know, we talk a lot, I think, often in the housing discussion in Vancouver about the, the importance of ensuring seniors can, can age in place. So many older people who have homes that are, um, that have become very valuable just through the passage of time and, and ensuring that, you know, through increasing property taxes, through pressures of development, that they're not forced out of their homes, which I think is a really important issue of fairness. But there's also the fact that a quarter of seniors in Canada um, you know, one in every four seniors is a renter. And for many of those people, especially if they've been renting for a long time, they're renting at far below market yeah. rates now, if they're evicted from that home, um, you know, whether that's a rent eviction or a demo eviction, or because they can no longer live safely in that home, they don't have access to the wealth of being a property owner. They can't, they can't leverage that to support them in the rest of their life. Um, they can't afford anything at market rates. They can no longer go out and get a higher paying job necessarily if they're in their 70s or 80s. And, and I think that is, you know, there's a discussion here around renters that often gets lost when we're focused on the idea that everyone can be an owner or a future owner. Um, and so I think, you know, this is one question that I have of, of many that came out of your last response, but in when we talk about solving the housing crisis, I think for many people the implicit idea there is that we're moving towards a solution where everyone can once again be a homeowner. And, and often when we say homeowner, we picture owning a home, like a single family home, which increasingly, you know, in our, in our contemporary era and the demographics we have in this country, that's not what the future will look like. Um, fairness does not look like everybody having a single family home. But that's such a, a central ideal. And to me, that seems like one of the central challenges is, you know, aside from the policy and the economic challenges, how do we, how do we collectively move past that idea that everyone should have what, what you have, which is a single family home yeah. with three kids yeah. on a journalist salary. I know. It's crazy. A journalist and a teacher's salary. I know. Yeah. And, and only because of the luck of timing. Uh, I, I think I, I agree, but we have to adjust our mindset. I'm also aware of how glaringly hypocritical that sounds for a guy who lives in Oak Bay in a single Pure family home. avocado <laughs> toast. <laughs> right. But, but we have to, and I, and I think we actually have to stop thinking of, and I, I know a lot of people have done this already, but let, let's be real, a lot of Canadians haven't. They haven't uh, exactly, like you say, moved away from that dream of the white picket fence and the single family home. And I think we need to think of home as a safe, reliable place that will be there and continue to be there and not bankrupt us or, or not uh, wake us up in the middle of the night with panic attacks that we're gonna lose it. So um, <clears throat> one of the ways we can achieve that, I mean, th th sorry, the short answer is, I don't actually know psychologically how you convince people. Part of it, sadly, is by pushing them so far to the brink. Like I've talked to a lot of young people who say, yeah, uh, you know, who I, I've mentioned that to them and they look at me kind of like a bit cynically like, yeah, look, buddy, look, dad, uh, 
that ship sailed a long time ago. You know, all I want now is maybe a two-bedroom apartment, or really, if I'm really lucky, at some point, a three-bedroom, or a, I just want someplace safe that I can call my own and that's gonna be reliable. And I've heard a lot of people say, actually, no, don't worry, already given up on the dream because the dream gave up on me. It's like a lot of people I've talked to who've left Vancouver who say, I didn't give up on Vancouver. Vancouver, you know, abandoned me. Or like the young Indian man who, who immigrated here two years ago, uh, who I got to chat with at my local 7-Eleven, and, and last time I saw him a couple weeks ago, he said, I'm giving up on Canada because this isn't the, the promise I was sold. I, I can't make a living here. I can't make a future here. But uh, the, 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 the question, I've forgotten your question. There you go. I'm off on such a tangent. Where, where How do we, we let go? What, I guess uh, yeah, the maybe mindset. a better way to think yeah, about it. What, what should we be developing a collective mindset around when we think about like what is the future of housing ideally if we solve, if we address the crisis? Well, I, I tell you what would help is if we had a heck of a lot more choice. Like I know uh, there's a big so debate about supply and demand and whether market forces or government should do that, but just set that aside for a second. If we had a lot more supply of a lot more different types of houses, a lot of people would rent them and find out, actually, you know what, I like this. When I moved to England, when I left my job across the road there at CBC Vancouver in 1999 and went to the BBC World Service, I ended up in this crowded house with a bunch of Australians and South Africans and New Zealanders. And at first, I remember looking around London where there's basically no detached houses, it's, it's all, in this neighborhood, terrace housing, like uh, attached row housing. And at first, my North American suburban brain was like, yeah, I, I don't know about this. But you know, within a few months, I, I thought, yeah, okay, I'm fine, as you acclimatize to things. And after a while, I thought, after about a year, what is wrong with North America? Why are we wasting all this space between houses? And my only point is you can acclimatize to things. Why, for instance, is it so hard to find a three-bedroom apartment? Anybody with two kids, I know kids, and, and I know that people around the world deal with much smaller spaces, but you know what it's like when your kids get of a certain age? Or maybe some of us can remember being kids and you want a different bedroom from your sibling. Why is it so hard, for goodness sake, to find three-bedroom apartments or townhomes. I know town the answer homes. to this, which is that nobody builds them. <laughs> exactly. And, but you know, or you know what else? I talked about Singapore, which again has huge caveats. They have this thing which is extremely popular because their public housing agency listens to people and they look at this at a number of, of, of levels. They have a flat or an apartment, which you own for 99 years, called a three-gen flat. It has two master suites and then two children's bedrooms and then for Singapore standards, a fair amount of space shared, kitchen and living room and, and balcony. But the thing you get with a three gen in having two master suites is you get place for, uh, for the parents and you get place for the grandparents. And a lot of them want to do this, especially if they want to be involved grandparents. I know not everybody does. I have met grandparents who don't want to be involved firsthand, have much experience with that. But my point is, if people want to do that, they have the option in the housing that's available to them. And what happens when those grandparents move in? Well, their flat is opened up, their three bedroom is opened up for the next generation coming along. We have very little, uh, like anybody, I mean, you and I were talking about being renters. I was a renter in Vancouver for years from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. It was basically, my choices were dingy basement suites of one or two bedrooms, and I don't remember a lot else. And I, I mean, Victoria's like the capital of unregulated basement suites, isn't it? But I mean, I've, that's, mm -hmm. that's the way I felt in Vancouver and Burnaby. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, there's not a lot, and, and we talk about missing middle, and I know it's a hugely contentious topic. People say, what good, what good uh, is it to the housing crisis if you tear down a single family home and replace it with four units in a fourplex that are all 1.3 or 1.4 million dollars? That's a fair question, never mind the fact that they'll all be sold and we'll all house people, but the more options we have, I think the more attitudes will change personally. That's true, and I mean, I live in the, the Vancouver version of the three gen home, which is that my parents, who were boomers, bought their house <laughs> in the 70s, and now I live there with my husband and our kids. Uh, and that, uh, when we moved in in 2019, <coughs> the developers who were renovating the house said that was a very common Vancouver arrangement now. <coughs> so, excuse me, <coughs> it's the housing crisis. <coughs> transition to the solution side of this because you identify a lot of solutions at the back of your book <coughs> and through your case studies and so I'm curious first of all what do you think right now you know as we are seeing the government 
both municipally, provincially, and federally take housing very seriously. They recognize this a major election issue. So what solutions are, are you seeing being implemented that, um, that you think the government is kind of getting right? What, do you, what are the signs of hope, I guess, you see? Because as you say a few times in this book, you know, this isn't necessarily the peak of the housing crisis. It could just be the beginning. So are you seeing signs of progress? What do you think the government is starting to get right? Um, uh, I'm going to give a really, uh, well, I'll, gi I'll give my quick CBC caveat, because I still work for CBC, that I do not support any party over the other, of course. But I actually mean that, because honestly, I, I think most, arguably all political parties, have given us enough reason to be cynical. Uh, if you look at the promises that are coming out in the last six months, holy cow, we're going to have this solved. I mean, look at, look at what the federal liberal government has been promising over the last six months arguably copying many of the steps we heard a few months earlier in Victoria from the BC NDP government. But, I mean, they have their own skeletons in their closets, right? If anybody goes back to the 2017 election campaign and looks at the NDP provincial promises for the number of uh, provincial affordable housing units uh, created, you're going to find them wanting. And that's not my opinion. It's not a partisan point of view. Uh, this is Auditor General's uh, pointing out the fact it's, it's a pretty simple accounting to say all governments are falling short. Well, and if I can interject with one yeah. of my favorite things, if you look up the Maple, which is a great independent media outlet, did a, an incredible analysis of how many MPs are also landlords and property, like real estate investors. And it is quite sobering to see, you know, this is a nonpartisan point because it cuts across all parties. A lot of our politicians who are involved oh in yeah. housing policy are heavily invested in the financialization of housing. And I think that is worth considering when we're talking about people who are tasked with making housing more affordable, who are literally invested in the current system of unaffordability. Yeah, so I, I mean, and that's a great, yeah, well, and that's a great point because there's a lot of politicians, including uh, some in, in Vancouver, who have uh, bought and sold an awful lot of homes. Uh, and, and, you know, that doesn't make a person a bad person. I understand that. I, I'm not suggesting it does. But it does, you, you do have to question your vantage point. I mean, if, if people like me who own homes, all of my neighbors are dead set against uh, putting up a multi-story uh, affordable seniors housing complex just behind us. And there's a lot of reasons for it. I understand. You know, you want... You want to preserve all sorts of things that, that you like about the neighborhood. And people who live in a neighborhood know it better than anyone else. That's true. But my goodness, if we all are only looking after our own vantage point, what, what, we're, this situation is just going to get worse. So back to your question, I'm, I mean, I've got to be a cynical journalist. Politicians make promises. Look at the, the liberal, I'm not trying to pick on the liberals, but it's just because they're in government. 2015, go back, Google 2015 liberal platform and look at those promises on housing. I interviewed Justin Trudeau when he came through our, our, uh, our studio. I asked him about them. They had very specific commitments on housing, affordable housing construction and financing that have not been delivered on. And so the only reason I bring that up, and don't get me wrong, same thing with the conservatives before them, uh, BC Liberal, BC NDP, again, it's not partisan, but we have a, a real reason and young people have a reason to be skeptical. So all that to say that the announcements on paper arguably have been uh, good if you believe that we need to seriously increase the supply of housing in the next decade and the supply of affordable below market rental housing in particular. But, you know, we've got to see action, not just words. Well, this the cynicism cured my dry throat. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, keep it flowing. If we reelect the liberal government, they're gonna solve all these problems with their new promises. I do think they're going to make a difference, though. I mean, you look, it, it's interesting, uh, every single hour, I mean, I, I, it's exhausting uh, talking about housing these days and trying to stay up on it. I keep getting these pings when I was walking here. And I looked at this and I thought, wait a minute, is this Trudeau announcement uh, on the CBC News headlines the one from this morning or yesterday? Oh, no, it's a brand new one on 1.5 billion. I mean, th they are uh, making announcements and following recommendations from all sorts of housing experts and, and peer-reviewed studies, no less, and, and, and people in the field who are saying, you've got to act, uh, act and, and bring about change. So, there, well, you, you said there's an election here. coming. I'll, I'll leave it to you. There, there's an election coming, uh, provincially and federally next year. Yes. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions in one minute. I have one last, one last question for this portion, which is, 
of, of the policy changes that you're seeing, of the directions you're seeing, of the policy uh, solutions that you get into in this final section of your book, which is fantastic, very concrete suggestions if you're looking for things to lobby your government about, what do you think is the most important if there's one action? Really be implemented. That is a very human question, and and I've uh, sum it up in a tweet. Yeah, I know. That's the problem. That, I mean, that's the response that we all want. Uh, I, I think I have about thirty-eight uh, recommendations a, at the you end. Got a lot at the end. Yeah, yeah. and I and I and so I. What make happens when you don't have a word count for your, uh, <laughs> your file? <laughs> I think it's thirty-eight. <laughs> 37. 37, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, and, and there could have been more, actually. I've been kicking myself over the last few months about a couple I didn't include. But the Second point I... Edition. Well, the, yeah, but the point I keep making is there is no one silver bullet. I mean, you could probably prioritize, and I might argue that every measure that could rapidly increase the supply of affordable below uh, rent, below market rent uh, housing is, is maybe the first need. But, but that's not the only one. And, I, and by that, I mean like a government and public agencies building and also tax incentive and interest rates, favorable loans for the, the private industry to build as well. But, but I mean, really, there are dozens, more than I've listed here, of changes that are needed. And arguably, all, most or all of them are needed. And one of the things I find fascinating is that every time anyone brings up one of these, one of the main arguments against it is, that's not gonna solve the housing crisis that we're still gonna have a city full of unaffordable homes. And in every case, they're right. But does that mean you don't do it? Because I think, th I think the solution is actually in the cumulative uh, change. And uh, I mean, the status quo just can't be an option anymore. It, it, it just can't. And I think governments are recognizing that. At least they're saying they're recognizing that. They're definitely telling us that they're recognizing that. It's true. Well, and actually, you know, uh, the, the provincial government is tabling legislation and they're getting, uh, you know, they're getting a lot, of, they're ruffling yeah, a lot of yeah. feathers over it. Yeah. And it's going to be messy. This is the other thing. I mean, I, I've talked to a lot of people who say another, another common uh, uh, retort is this isn't going to solve the housing crisis on its own and some people are going to get hurt or there's going to be unintended consequences. Yeah, there is. This is what happens when you leave something to become such a crisis. People say, oh, well, you know what? If you allow fourplexes uh, a zoning by right instead of single family home, the, the value of that lot is going to go up. I asked David Eby about that. He said, well, I'm not sure about that because we're doing it across the board, whereas other jurisdictions have done it by city by city. But I think they might be right. I, I don't know. This is, we're all speculating, but they might be right. But, but it, so if my property becomes worth 1.8 instead of 1.5 million, yeah, I guess I do make money. Uh, let's be honest here. But if, if, if the guy who buys it is going to create four new family homes instead of one, maybe we're ahead. But, or or another, another problem, uh, old affordable rentals are going to get torn down to build. I, I cycle by one all the time, three stories. They've replaced it with six stories. They've doubled the number of housing units. They've also displaced a number of seniors who are now struggling to find a place they can afford. My point is, it's messy. And there are gonna be countless examples with every switch that's made of people getting hurt, uh, which makes it all the more difficult to enact these. I actually do have uh, sympathy for a lot of politicians, despite my cynicism. They have hard jobs, we wouldn't wanna be them. No. Uh, it's a really great optimistic note to pause on for questions. Do people have questions for Gregor? <gasps> yes. I personally do because my parents, who are my landlords, give me a very fair rate. <laughs> <laughs> but I spend that disposable income on childcare. <laughs> oh yeah, there, there's a whole other book. I, that's a great question. And actually, this is one of the things that's given me hope because I, I do remember uh, in years past, just, just 
doing thousands of radio interviews, uh, a, a much more polarized argument on this, and, and forgive me the political cliches, but you'd have the left saying, government needs to do this, and the right saying, government just gets out of the way and let industry do this. But actually, including a lot of chambers of commerce types, and actually chambers of commerce, uh, uh, heads, uh, but more and more, the Toronto Board of Trade is on is in on this in a big way. They 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 partnered with the big, uh, biggest social housing provider in Tro Toronto to say we need essential worker housing, mm -hmm. publicly subsidized housing for nurses and care aides and teachers and all the rest of it, and 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 there's a lot of the Victoria Chamber of Commerce. I mean, I'm just. Uh, throwing uh, groups off the top of my head. More and more business owners I talk to say, you know what? Uh, one of the guys I interviewed was the former mayor of Santa Monica, California, and I know this is in the US, but they've been grappling with Airbnb and short-term rentals, and he said, you know, I'm a capitalist, but some things do not work being left to market forces, and we can't leave housing uh, and treat it just like any other business. So I, I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot more convergence in that, and a lot of business uh, groups and agencies and owners are, are thinking that way, I think. I'm a capitalist butt is a great title for a memoir. <laughs> um, I would also add to that, I think we are, we are seeing that um, in some sectors, like as Gregor says, there's, there's movements in different cities around um, creating like essential worker housing. I think Vancouver is also trying to do that. They, there is some movement around that for um, like healthcare worker and resources, especially in the healthcare kind of neighborhoods. Um, I think Qualicum Beach also has been looking at creating like dedicated housing for firefighters where they have issues with recruiting and sustaining a volunteer firefighter force, for instance, in some communities on the island. So I think we're seeing it in different, um, like different municipalities recognizing different needs. I would also say I think Whistler is the municipality that is voluntarily enacting some of the Airbnb um, restrictions, the short-term rental restrictions from which I think they would be exempted under the new provincial um, regulations, but it's because they have a real crisis of housing for workers. Like Whistler is a, is a city that runs on a tourism economy and many of those workers can't afford to live there anymore. And so we are seeing, I think, municipalities react with um, measures for their specific demographic and economic needs. And hopefully those provide some models. But yeah, I mean, I think it's really challenging. I think that I think a lot of businesses still <laughs> have have such disparate um, like employee bases and needs and, and in a lot of cities, like we were talking before this about how Vancouver and Toronto are cities that are increasingly drawing this globalized workforce of people who can afford the housing costs here, as well as drawing on a workforce of people who are born in the city where to some sense there's less mobility. You know, the ability of someone from Saskatchewan to move to Vancouver now is is I think probably obliterated by housing costs. Um, but if you can meet that market locally, it's harder to see that, that fracturing. I think the mobility and the inter-provincial mobility, the, the mobility that people used to have between cities is disappearing, but I think that takes longer to show up. Maybe, yeah. Oh, two at the back. Uh, you guys can fight it out. I think yes, but with huge caveats. And the only, uh, I know this is annoying, people just want a straight answer, but the problem with, it, my, my short answer is yes, uh, but the problem is once you start talking about supply and demand, people get sidetracked uh, by uh, economic arguments. You know, people say, well, wait a minute, no, it's, you can't just, what some people mean by uh, address supply and demand uh, and uh, to meet demand is, they just think it's just market forces. Let the industry take care of that. And there's example after example after example where a municipality okays something, and then what you see is that private developers, and who can blame them, are gonna make the most profit possible, and ultimately they're, they're, they're building, in a, in a community of, of great shortage, they're building uh, really nice homes. And often, you, you know, you're seeing them marketed overseas in places like Shanghai and Dubai and so on, where new condo developments are, are, so you're, you're, you're increasing supply, but it's not 
uh, for the vast majority of people who can't afford any home to live. So uh, the, the short answer is yes, but the problem is how do you get there? Because uh, I think there's an argument, and I've talked to a lot of uh, economists and housing activists who said if you just uh, you know, take away regulation and, and let uh, private industry take care of it, you're going to have an awful lot more homeless people and people living precariously for a decade or two until you get there. So, but, but I personally think, and this is contentious, people say, you know what, if it was about supply, then Vancouver would be the most affordable city in the world because it's added a bunch of housing in the last 50 years. But has it added enough housing? That's, that's the, the point. I think that's the point to yours. So sorry for the long rambly answer. I think, yes, ultimately it is a question of supply, but in the short term, it's got to be, we have to have a focus on supply and at least as much focus on a supply of affordable housing. We're going to, we're, this, this fellow back here had his hand up and then we'll go to you. Sorry, uh, yeah, Hi, Russell. I, I see it just as a resident, not a journalist, a writer. I see it all the time. I mean, the, there was an example in Oak Bay where I live where they tried to get on a main street, Oak Bay Avenue, the village, a three-story condominium developed, and it took nine years before council finally rejected it. You know what the name of this place was? It was very aptly called The Quest. <laughs> no kidding. It's actually since been approved. And you know what's changed between now and then? The provincial government came in and said, uh-uh, not happening anymore, quotas. And this, as I say, this is going to make a lot of people upset. I understand people love their neighborhoods. I love my neighborhoods. And I predict your neighborhoods are going to change and you're not going to love all of it if you're a homeowner who's been there for decades. Uh, but that is what I think government, higher levels of governments are going to decide. And that's what the province is deciding. And they're going to look around and see places like France, which has made a huge increase in its uh, proportion of of affordable housing in Ile-de-France, the, the greater Paris region, by doing exactly that. They're just like, you know what? Municipalities, you can't say no anymore. 25% affordable housing, period. And they're not just saying it to Paris, where they had a communist mayor. They're saying it to all the, the equivalents of the Oak Bay or the West Vans in Ile-de-France. And it's changing. And not everybody has their say. And, not, and certainly not everybody likes it. But it's creating a lot more affordable housing. Bravo. I would also say, in response to the last question about whether just, you know, if we have enough supply, have we solved the housing crisis? I think we can see examples where just building housing is creating different kinds of crises where, you know, housing is interconnected. So I think, for instance, in Olympic Village, which became a very dense and wonderful neighborhood, but has no school for children. Ooh. Hot tip. Announcement tomorrow. Uh, but... <laughs> But you know that's an example where where you can't just have housing in isolation, right? Like it it would be helpful if some of these government agencies were working more harmoniously, where you know the provincial government only funds schools once there's like a critical mass of children in that neighborhood who are school aged, as opposed to proactively funding schools. Um, and so I think in addition to lobbying for more housing, it's lobbying for the services to support people to live in these communities, which include housing, transit, education, healthcare. Um, that's just my addition to that question. I would really love if there were more schools and daycares. You had a question. Well, and then they, they have to pay a vacancy tax, which then the local government gives back to them. 
And what you're saying, I think, is what I was trying to articulate. I think you might have done a better job of it to that question about supply. I mean, I think the long-term answer is, yeah, we just need a lot more housing. But inevitably, when you chip away at it, and when municipalities and private builders and governments and communities and homeowners are restricted, that's what you get, is all of this effort, and uh, municipalities feel squeezed, developers start negotiating, and what you get is more for the, the upper middle class and the wealthy and less for uh, you know, those who need it most, arguably. But, but, but again, I, I'm not convinced that those, those projects shouldn't be built because I think there's a shortage across the spectrum. With, it, with the possible exception of the $15 million mansions in Point Grey and Uplands, uh, you know, near where I live. And you know, one interesting, super quick anecdote, I talked to a friend's uh, son who's just finished the UBC Family Medicine Program in Victoria, and he said, we just got renovicted from this house, we were paying 4,000 or whatever. He said, I thought we were gonna have to leave Victoria. And we, he said, I found this uh, uh, rental on Marketplace on Facebook, and I couldn't believe it. Anyway, they found a mansion in Uplands of Victoria, and the guy works in tech, and he works in Calif he, he lives in California, and he said, he said, I, 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 because of this vacancy tax, I just decided it was worth it to rent it for, to a nice family for the next five years. And he, he's got this incredibly nice house for much less than the not very nice house he was having. So, Again, that one, you know, there's a lot of examples of how it's not going to do it on its own. It's not a silver bullet, but it sure helped that family, and I've talked to a few others in similar situations. I mean, I would love Vancouver to return to its... Shaughnessy used to be a neighborhood of rooming houses, you know? Let's bring that back for those $20 million <laughs> mansions. Put some student housing in there. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, oh, so okay. let's do it. Thanks. Well, relatively, yes, but, but easy, no, not necessarily, especially for middle class, working people or lower class. But you know, I mean, there's so many numbers swimming around. Uh, I uh, quoted a speech from the CEO of CIBC, who of course, his name I forget. Anyway, he went to Pier, Pier 21 in Halifax, and he gave a speech, uh, going back to this question, do, does business care? Uh, and, and he said, we are losing opportunity because it is more unaffordable practically than ever in this country. And, and one of the statistics he gave is that when his dad uh, uh, left U the former Yugoslavia, Croatia, and, and landed at Pier 21, that's why he was there in 1960, the average Canadian household income was, I think it was 15,000, and the, uh, pardon me, uh, 5,000, and the average price of an average Canadian house was 15,000, three to one, uh, and that's nationally. Uh, when he gave the speech a couple years ago, it was 700,000 and 70,000, it was 10 to one. Now I know interest rates make a decision, as you know, from 35 years ago, but even like, you know, dollar to dollar purchasing power, especially in Vancouver, did you see the latest uh, study from RBC out yesterday? You need more than 100% of the average income to buy the average composite house. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The national average is something like 70. Vancouver's more than 100%. It is genuinely, more unaffordable than ever. It's not the avocado toast, it's not the whatever. Uh, and yes, previous generations did struggle. I, I don't mean to take that away from people, but we just have to look at uh, the prospects for our young generation and say, no, it, this is a genuine affordability crisis. Yeah. I would just add to that, I think for, for younger generations too, there's compounding factors, one of which is that um, many people are graduating from their first, from university with, with levels of student debt that were previously unimaginable. Um, and that wa wages have stagnated or grown much more slowly than, than home prices. So you're seeing people coming out at a disadvantage from university, working for lower incomes to save for a much longer time to reach the point of being able to afford a down payment while housing prices are rising much faster than their incomes. So, and at the same time, I think the financialization of housing um, in the last couple of decades where rentals have become a really, you know, condos have become a really, um, the major kind of housing being built in Canada and, and many of those condos being owned by investors 
means that renting is uh, increasingly eating up a large portion of people's income and becoming extremely unstable. So I think, I mean, again, I think it's a really like important question to think, you know, how do we make housing purchasing a home more affordable? But also it's, I think, looking at how do we make housing in general for people who, who would like to rent for their life or who should be able to rent for their life, making that a viable option as well in a national way. Um, you know, maybe not everybody should be a homeowner, but everybody should have a home. Ooh, you like that. The, the, the least sexy thing I, I wrote about and the thing that actually excited me the most was co-op housing. And I, I've known people in co-op housing for 48 years. It's one of my first memories as a good friend who lived in a co-op housing complex in Calgary. I know it's not a new idea, but this country basically abandon new co-op and I know you know everyone's gonna have an example of well no no there's that one that was built but you know in a big way and I looked at Germany and they have ten times uh, the number of people living in co-op housing per capita as we do and I mean it, it provides so many things and obviously it's not for everybody a lot of people just say I don't want to live in a co-op community but a lot of people do and especially if you're single and getting older you've got community uh, you've got you've got people around you you can help in many many ways you've also got a financial buffer in most well-run co-ops uh, to wild fluctuation in rent and property ownership and so on so there's one more th other thing that we could be doing one of I don't that might be number 22 uh, who knows yeah. or maybe it's number three I don't remember co-op co housing is the dream here I feel like everybody wants to win that co-op housing lottery very sexy topic. But what if your odds were 10 times what they are now? Oh, the dream. I love leaving it on this uh, non-sexy but nonetheless titillating point. Uh, and if you have other questions for Gregory, you can ask them while he's signing books. Purchase the book from our good friends at Upstart and Crow. Thank you for coming to discuss this thrilling topic. Thank you, Michelle. Buy Gregory's book. It's a great read. If you're me, it'll make you want to move to Tokyo, but you can find all kinds of places you might want to move when you read this. <laughs>